the wind has been howling the past few days, we decided to go hunting right off of a highway here. Hunting season is on. May 1st is sort of an opener, Larry Lonick, in a way. It's the beginning of morel mushroom season. That's right. And how many mushroom hunters do we have in this state? Oh, about 600,000. That's a, quite a healthy army. No guns. No uh, fishing tackle, no uh, spears. No license. No license, no nets, anything. What, what we're taking here is a paper bag to put the mushrooms in. I carry a day pack with me when I go outdoors, Larry. If we were going to go on an expedition, you know, say all day long, I'd put a lunch in here. Now I have some first aid supplies. A compass. That's right, a compass. Now I got my compass right on here. This is a pin on compass. Compass, very important when you go mushroom hunting because we know where this road is that we started from. Mm -hmm. And if we get lost by chance, all we have to do is get back to the road. And we are, the road is to the south to us, so we'll walk back south and we'll be all set. You ever been lost mushroom hunting? I get lost every year. <laughs> I mean, this is something serious. And if this happens towards evening, you're in trouble. So all you need is a compass. You have a walking staff. Mm -hmm. This is to uh, move some of the branches out of the way to look for morels, but also to keep uh, raspberry bushes and things like that from scratching you up. Okay, well, this is all you need for mushroom hunting, and as a Tree said, uh, you don't need a license either. True, true. His nickname is Tree. He has a book coming out on mushrooms. Uh, why do they call him Tree? Well, actually, I've been standing up on the hill right here. He's one tall fella, but we're going to go mushroom hunting, so grab a paper bag and come along. It's Thursday night. I'm Fred Trost, and it's time for Michigan Outdoors. Well, I tell you, the past few days, the wind has been howling 60, 80 miles an hour in some areas. We're going to have to duck into the woods. I know we probably have some microphone noise here, Tree. But you say that right off the highway, this looks like a good morel hunting spot. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Are power lines, are these openings any good for mushrooms? No, no, but uh, the woods behind it, you've got an older woods back here. Uh, and a lot of times you might find mushrooms along the very edge of the woods. It's sort of, sort of a, a fence row kind of effect. You mean along the edge of where an older woods comes to a meadow or something? Yes, exactly. Okay. What about aspen stands? I thought you looked for, like, young aspen stands. They aren't any good? Uh, aspen stands aren't, aren't notorious for morels. Uh, elm are. Mm -hmm. uh, stumps. Um, older woods decay. Uh, today we'll probably be looking for a slightly lower, swampier area. Okay, well, we're going to do it. We'll duck out of the wind now and get into the woods. Okay, now the mushrooms that we're talking about are morel mushrooms, sponge mushrooms. There's two different types. There's the black morel that comes out early, which is right. what we're looking for right now. Exactly. And uh, the, actually, there's four different types that grow in Michigan. The black ones come out first, and they end up with the, the large, sort of blondish colored ones that grow up to 10, 11, 12 inches tall. Mm -hmm. The ones we're looking for today probably will be... Uh, two to three, four inches uh, tall. Of course, the white morels come out later. What about mid mid May? Uh, they'll be about two weeks after the after the black ones come out. Mm -hmm. So we probably have a four to five week picking season. That's one of the enjoyable things about mushroom hunting is some of the flowers you see here. You know what this one is, tree? I'm not sure what that yellow one is. Here's a uh, there's some wild violets here also though. Oh, right over here. Look at these. The woods will probably be just full of these in another week or so. Trilliums, jack in the pulpits, a lot of really pretty flowers. Nice to be out at this time of year. Oh, yeah. You know, Tree, those, uh, those woods up there with the wildflowers have the appeal of mushroom hunting, but I don't know about this business. This is getting a lot like hunting. It's not all fun. But it's all enjoyable. <laughs> Not fun, but enjoyable. <laughs> well, here we are in a little bit of a clearing through the thick stuff. We've lost some of the beauty, but what have we gained? Why are we here? Well, we're here because it's a beautiful day, and, and we're outside, and everything smells good and looks good, and the taste of the morels is the main reason why we're here. But why do we have to crawl through all this brush? Uh, actually, places where the most inaccessible places seem to be where morels seem to hide. Is this early season? Are, are we in a, a sort of a swampy, marshy area here because it's early? Yes, this, this is the very beginning of the season. These, the the morel, morels we're looking for now will be the black ones, the first ones out. Mm -hmm. So we want to get to the low, moist areas. Are we low enough? Can we start looking now? Or? We, uh, I've been looking. Oh, okay. But, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start looking too now. The hunt is on. Whoa-oh, over here. We got one, Larry. Look at that. Right here. There it is, a black morel, the first one of the season for me. 
I know you found them before. Look at that. It looks so beautiful right there. It doesn't hurt anything to pick them, too, because they're... Pin, pinch them off at the base. That's the best pinch, way to... Pinch that off? You want, you want to keep them as clean as possible in your bag, because in case you do find okay. enough to dry, you want them to be as clean as possible. You're not going to wash them. Okay, now, there should be more right around here. Where we found one, the best, the best thing to do is just uh, almost sit in the same spot and look around. You'll probably find more. Okay. What about that over there? There's one right there. Okay. Ah, do you see it, Nick? Okay, look, see it right? Boy, they are difficult to see. It looks like a little mound of black dirt. Now, can you follow right up through there? Can you point it out with your stick there, Larry? Aha, oh, that was just one. I thought I saw a whole group of them here. Oh, there's, there's another one. one right there. Okay, right there's here it is. one over there. Right, here we are. Go ahead and pick that one, Larry. You take the honors. Pinching off at the base. Okay, now over here, there's one right there. here's one. Oh, this is getting fun now. Down on our knees. Oh, another one right here. Right here. Okay, oh, look right up there. Right here. See that one right up there? Oh, this is, this is all right. Now we're having some fun. I know it. Now isn't this, didn't you forget all, this is, forget you know, all about that bad uh, honestly, land we just went through? Honestly, this sounds silly, but my heart gets beating about like deer season when the deer are coming <laughs> through. This is fun. It's really like one giant Easter egg hunt. Mm -hmm. For kids of all ages. Okay, let's look for more, for some more. See how many we can accumulate here. I don't know if we're gonna get a bag full. I don't see any more, I think they're gone. I tell you, it is so difficult looking through the leaves, all the shadows, the dark areas. I see one right back over here, Fred. Do you? Okay. A little bit bigger. Bigger? Yep, see it sticking out over here? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, a dandy. Look at that one, can you see it there, Dick? Look at that. Hunting the elusive morel, something anybody can do, a paper bag, some hiking shoes, long sleeve shirt. Oh, you got some more there, Tree? I got another one over here. Okay, I'm gonna put the microphone down. The hunt is on. We just found some in this area. Ah, right here, right here. Look at this. They are so, you know, they are pretty. They are, they are. They cool. really are. They're, they're so clean. Here's one right next to it. Oh, yeah. How about that? Do you expect to see more than this? Uh, you know, we're start, start starting to range, you know, 15, 20, 30 feet from the last one we saw. Should we be concentrating on this area real close, or? They seem to run in veins. And uh, you, that, again, that's usually where you find one, although they're, they're all singles. You've noticed mm -hmm. them all been singles, but usually where you find one, I notice as we're looking, or as we're talking, we're, all, we're both looking different directions well, along the ground. Yeah, the, the, the tape story here has got to end real soon. <laughs> got to <laughs> load up the bag. I've never ran across, uh, across this much success right off the bat early in May. This is probably the best I've had this early also. A good sign. Maybe the fishing went to pot because of the <laughs> high wind and cold weather, but the mushrooming looks great. You know, that mushroom hunting trip worked out pretty well as a substitute for our trout fishing. We were supposed to have a trout fishing segment on this evening's show. However, 60, 80 mile an hour gusts of winds throughout the state on, well, this past weekend, Monday, Tuesday, uh, really prevented us from getting out there and fishing. Now, the Farmer's Almanac, here's the good news, predicted cold, windy, wet weather for this week, and we've got it. And it says this weekend it should be sunny and mild. Boy, we're looking forward to that to push those mushrooms up through, and we will be trout fishing and report on that next week. Let's take a look right now, a little tape of some inland lake fishing just to give you a teaser of what's going on. We took this last year, almost at this time of year, around the 15th, up at Holton Lake. You can catch rock bass, crappie, perch, bluegill, uh, pike and walleye when they come in season. The nice thing about fishing in the inland lakes right now is that there's lots of elbow room. You have to dress a little warmly, but that goes for any of the activities coming up in May. Sunrise is going to be 6.30 if you want to get out there this weekend, and sunset about 8.45. They've taken some big ones. How big? Well, I'll tell you what, they're big enough to make our Michigan Outdoors trophy report. Well, here are our first two trophy anglers this week. We have right here Dick Bradley, school teacher from Lansing, and Greg Edgerton. You guys have got some trophy fish that our audience, I think a lot of them will be impressed, don't you? Well, I hope so, yeah. 
When I watched your show last week, I looked at the little ones out of Huron, and I thought maybe we might be lucky enough to come up with something a little bigger, and we were. We're talking smelt. Get a load of these. Pick them up, guys. You know, no, pick them up like they're trophy fish. You know how we do on the trophy report. These are smelt that were taken where? Well, they're up in the Grand Traverse Bay area. There's a lot of streams up there, and they're pretty much the same along that area. They come out of deeper water, I think, is probably why they run a little larger. Boy, how big is this one? This one is nearly 11 inches long. You know, this is one of the few times you're ever going to see an angler holding a smelt by the gills like that. That's, <laughs> that's really something. Uh, yeah, we've seen them even bigger up there. And my personal best is about 13 and 3 quarters. We think there's fish 15 up in that area. 15-inch smelt. We're just going to have to have this added to the master angler program. Greg, you use a mesh net like this. Why? Well, I like the be able to flexibility of it. It doesn't quite have the weight. It's uh, real good in uh, slower water. Mm -hmm. Where uh, Dick used Whoa! This wind is something else. <laughs> this is going to put the smelt to bed. But you like the mesh net because of the flexibility. I like the flexibility of it. Okay, now Dick, our other trophy smelt angler here, you, you have the, the wire solid cone net. Now when the water swirls, you can get down into it and you uh, seem to be able to get, get under the fish pretty well. The disadvantage is that some of the big ones sometimes hit that with their tail and they flip right out. We oh, missed some. listen to this, some we of did. the we big ones. some bigger ones, we really did. <laughs> okay, well hold them up there one more time, <laughs> side by side. These are a couple of the smelt they got. Did you do well on your smelt dipping? We did about, about four gallons, I would say. Not quite a five gallon can full. Well, terrific. Let's get a close up on these. These are our smelt anglers this year who <laughs> made our trophy report. As smelting winds up, turkey season begins in Michigan, and lucky hunter Doug Smith from Homer sent us a photo of his trophy gobbler. It weighed in at 20 pounds, 4 ounces, had a 10-inch beard. He got it just south of Houghton Lake at 3.30 in the afternoon on opening day. Congratulations, Doug. That's his first turkey in four years of hunting. Well, this fellow has spent a lifetime hunting, always comes home with something for the table. That's LaVon Howard of Lansing with some of his family and friends there, and look at the morels. They hunt somewhere west of Houghton Lake. Last year, took this group of white morels later in May. Boy, that's an inspiration to all morel hunters. But here's the real inspiration. It's a morel that's close to a foot tall, a white morel, and LaVon gave this whopper to me last fall. Unfortunately, we can't get it mounted, but I have it frozen, and we're going to eat it. In fact, we're going to have have some morels very soon, so stay tuned, and we'll make LaVon Howard our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Hunter of the Week. We do want to see your letters here in the mailbag. Ed, let's answer a couple. Okay, here's one from New Baltimore. Please send me your latest issue of the Club Digest. I love watching your show. Keep up the good work. P.S. Next time, will you bite the heads off the smelt? Digest is in the mail. Thanks for the compliments. No way. Not on those smelt. All right. Here's another one. I would like to know if the DNR is thinking of closing pheasant hunting for a couple of years so the pheasant population can grow. I heard we were getting pheasant brought to Michigan. Wouldn't this be a good time to let the pheasant population grow and be plentiful again? Oh, it'd be a great time to let that pheasant population grow. The only trouble is not hunting the pheasant won't make any difference because hunters did not cause the decline of uh, the pheasant population. We only shoot the roosters, Bill. And the roosters... Uh, there's far more roosters in the wild than are needed to propagate the hens because the hens are the ones that determine the future population. And after a hunting season is done, virtually every hen is still in the field. If she survives the winter, she lays eggs. That's our future crop. Now, if we don't take roosters or we do take roosters, it really isn't going to make any difference. The problem is somewhere else, Bob. And it may be genetics. Uh, that's why we're bringing in those birds from China. Mm -hmm. That's it, and we think maybe a new strain, we'll put some new blood in, revitalize the pheasant, and maybe it'll be uh, better able to adapt to the current conditions. I think right. the genetics have just sort of petered out. That's the thought in the DNR anyway, and I concur with that. It's worth a try. Jim from uh, Lapeer, you cornered me up at the Meadowbrook Mall last Sunday, and you said, Fred Trost, I don't mean to be picky, but you didn't sign your turkey permit when you had it on the air. Isn't that against the law? Well, here's my turkey permit right here. I got it out, and I said, well, I'll be doggone. It has room for signature. Bob, was I a violator for three days? No, as a matter of fact, you weren't. Uh, although most people, uh, some permits do need to be signed. There's nothing in the commission order says that you have to sign a turkey permit. In fact, the DNR's thinking next year, just taking that space completely off. You're either Fred Trost or you're not, you know, in the print. <laughs> That's right. Folks, you're going to have to keep watching, keep looking, wait for me to make a mistake on a violation. 
Gotten kind of close several times, and all these are technicalities, but they're kind of fun to look for. By the way, this cost me $7.25 for this permit, and hunters pay, I think, quite a bit of money for wildlife conservation through their license fees. You know how much it is? Well, let's take a look at our outdoor quiz. The small bits of bacon are, they're done now, right, Tree? They are done. Put the, put some morels in here? Now's the time you add the morels. Put about uh, oh, a third of them or so in there. We're cooking these morels. These are the ones we got on Tuesday in bacon grease, but this is after the bacon has been cooked. And you can leave it right in the pan. The moisture from the morels will keep the bacon from getting any more done. Kind of an interesting phenomenon. I think we have that grease hot enough, don't we? <laughs> Should I turn it down a little bit? Yeah, turn it down a little bit, would you say? Okay. What's the trick to cooking the morels in bacon grease? Uh, again, you want the bacon to be completely done. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, you add the morels. The moisture keeps the bacon from frying more. It turns to a bit of a gravy, and then that gravy will boil back into the morels. And that takes how long? Uh, approximately 60 seconds once okay. the bacon's done. Can I put some in the butter here? And is that, yes. And, there we uh, go. We're going to run a taste test here of what we're going to do. What about sautéing the mushrooms in butter? How long does that take? Again, that, that takes about 60 seconds. We're, we're trying to get this so both of them are done at the same time. Okay. But uh, it, it's a little uh, lower of a temperature with butter, and uh, it's it's a light sauté. Are these done? 60 seconds must have been elapsed. Um, not quite. You can see that there's a little bit of gravy is starting to clear up. The bacon grease is starting to clear mm -hmm. up, and they're real close to being done right now. Whenever you want, you can scoop them out. We're going to have Kathy and Bob taste test and see whether they like like morels cooked better in bacon grease or butter. Which do you prefer? I like, uh, I like the bacon. Okay. It gives sort of a, a hickory kind of a uh, flavor to uh, morels, which have a mm -hmm. meaty flavor. Okay, and I think I'm going to turn this up a little bit more with the butter. But they're sautéing much more slowly. All right. Why don't we take that over there? Are, are these done yet, would you say? Uh, those, those are done also. See, it doesn't take long, folks. <laughs> it's just a matter of moments. If you want to scoop those up onto there, okay. I will. There they are. Oh. If you want to scrape some out on your plate and try those, those you are. Share. <laughs> sure. Morels cooked with bacon, 120 seconds. 120 seconds? A minute and 20 seconds, you say. How about so a minute and 20 like seconds? And there's some in butter. Well, they're taste testing those. Let me show you what we did here. These are the morels that we picked. I put them in Tupperware in the refrigerator, and they've been in a, oh, about a day and a half. Look just like when we picked them. Mm hmm. They'll, they'll preserve three or four days in a Tupperware in a refrigerator. Keep them in a dry place. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you might want to slip that off of the burner there. In cleaning the mushrooms, what you want to do is put them in some water. Do you soak them for long? Uh, you only need to soak them for just a matter of five minutes. Just bounce them around a little bit in the water. Throw okay. them on. And the dirt comes off of the stems and so on. Right. This is what they look like when they're done. Now, the morel is hollow in the middle but this uh, cap connects to the stem, so there's no place for bugs or anything to get up in there. True. Have you ever eaten these raw? Uh, I, I think I did one time 10 years ago, and I couldn't find a reason to do it again. Huh, I'll give it a try here. Bite the head off a of morel. Hmm. Hmm. Rabbits and squirrels and deer don't do it. They don't do it? They don't have a whole, they're interesting. I want to show you one way of preserving. Here's one of LeVon Howard's mushrooms, which we're going to cook up. This was frozen. And this has been in the refrigerator, sort of rubbery almost. And uh, you don't prefer freezing? I prefer drying. Drying. Uh, Here's what I did with mushrooms. They're a day and a half old. I put them on a string. Look at these. Dried out completely. Those you could put in a little uh, paper lunch sack and keep them indefinitely. Huh. That's an interesting way to store mushrooms. We have information on this in the Club Digest, but I want to get the rundown here. How are they? Great. Which is better? Bacon. Butter. Bacon and butter? Okay. <laughs> well, you can cook them up both ways at home. Tree Lonic here has a book coming out on mushrooms, which we thought would be out last fall. Then we thought it would be out this spring. Now we're looking for midsummer. There's still some new developments. It's Let's say it's going to be in the outdoor headlines when his book comes out, but it's something that we're all waiting for. Called The Curious Morel. The Curious Morel. Larry Tree Lonick's book. Pretty good stuff? Great. Get out there yeah. mushroom hunting. This is a barn owl. It's uh, very uncommon. As a matter of fact, it's on the endangered species list in the state of Michigan. 
we hope to, with funds from our annual Funds for Freedom Wildlife Art Auction, raise, breed in captivity, and release to the wild barn owls, both here and down at the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary. Uh, we, we have an exceptionally nice selection of artwork at this year's auction that will benefit these birds. We have an original painting uh, by Geismert von Frankenhausen uh, of a collage of wildlife art uh, or wildlife rehabilitation species. We also have uh, a real nice print uh, by Larry Hayden, Flurry of Wings. And we also have uh, a real nice color remarked print of a great blue heron by Leonard Wades. So hopefully this year's auction will raise a lot of funds that will help benefit this uh, species here in the state of Michigan. Deteriorated? That's, yeah, that's, that's just starting to deteriorate. All right, let me pick that the here. The was probably three or four days old, and in the sun, you can see how that stem is starting to dry and, and, it, and it fell over off of its stem. Yeah, well, it does feel drier. Now, is that okay to pick and eat? It's still good as long as, as, long as they're dry. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of, the, one of the methods of preserving them is to string them together and dry them mm -hmm. in the fresh air and sunshine. Okay. It's an excellent way to dry There was them. another one around here something. Oh! You had your hand on it right here. Just this one right it. there. That's it, the morel mushroom. The object of an extensive hunt during the month of May in Michigan Outdoors.